Good evening, Dr. Punya. Glad to have you uh, in this uh, Q&A up close and uh, personal. Yeah, it seems like uh, it has been uh, two months um, since your last uh, Breaking Myth uh, presentation. And we kind of uh, missed your talk, your Dharma talk. And I heard that uh, you also went for your operations for the eyes and hope that uh, you are recovering well. Uh, tell us, uh, how, how are you now? Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to the Dhamma family, Namabhadaya. We originally planned to have only a three-week break, but unfortunately, due to unavoidable circumstances, that three weeks became two months. And in the meanwhile, I went for my eye surgery for one eye. And it was supposed to have the second surgery the following week in the next eye. And then by the third week, I should be back on my feet. But unfortunately, uh, things went beyond my control. And the lens for my right eye had to be specially made and brought in from America. And because of COVID-19, it took six weeks to bring the lens in. And so for that six weeks, I was half blind functioning with only one eye. And finally, we managed to get it sorted out. And that's why now we are back on our feet. I am thankfully okay. I can see reasonably well now after the operation. And um, it's been good. The experience has been quite pleasant. I've been very lucky throughout. And I'm glad to be back so that we can resume our usual evening sharings. Thank you to all who send wishes. So right now you can do away with your with your specs. Uh, yes, right now I do not need to wear spectacles unless I'm looking at something really close, like half a feet away. Then of course I I, I wear reading glasses if I need to do that. But the usual reading a book, I do not need to wear reading glasses. Glad to hear that you find the pleasure without specs. Oh yes, oh yes, I want especially. Specs for almost 50 years of my life and that's why I thanked the surgical colleague yeah. who operated for, for me and I said you've given me sight one of the things on my bucket list yeah <laughs> well that's also one of the reasons why I went for LASIK uh, uh, previously because I need to do exercise and also practice yoga right so with the spectacles you actually can't see what the teacher has been teaching with the placing of the hand, uh, the posture. So that's why I say, oh, might as well just get away with it without the spectacles much easier. And then it's actually a lifestyle choice rather than the necessity, actually. Yeah. So, so but then for, for you, glad that um, all went well. Yeah. Right? Yes. Thank you. And uh, I also know that um, your. Um, going for this uh, walking uh, in the Buddha's uh, uh, footprints uh, session uh, soon. But I'm also curious, actually, what prompted you to write the second book, Breaking Meets, after the first book? Oh, okay. The second book actually was not meant to be the book in the first place. It was actually a, a whole series of articles that I wrote and sent out using the Facebook media to various Buddhist societies and various Buddhist interest groups. And that was it. And it was really in response to a lot of views that people had about Buddhism, the organized religion, which were not exactly correct. And so it was just articles that I wrote uh, trying to explain um, what is reality, what is mythology, and what has crept into the organized religion so much that people thought it is what the Buddha taught. And it was actually a trip down by uh, Didi Huat Chai, who knew about what I wrote. And Didi Huat Chai was actually the one who uh, asked me, why don't you put it all into a book? Because if not, you know, after a while, it would have been scattered all over the internet and people would have forgotten about it. Mm. And we thought it was a good idea. I discussed it among my Dhamma brothers and sisters in JB. And they said, yeah, we would like to do that. 
And so within a very short time, um, everyone who was involved agreed, we raised the money. And then of course, um, we got to put it into a book format. And thanks to sister from Singapore, Siu Yin, she did a lot of work um, helping me to put it into a proper book format. And so that was done and uh, we used that on, uh, or as the occasion to dedicate that book to the memory of Brother Ju Singh's son. And we thought that was a very good thing. And so after that was all done and the book was distributed, um, only then later on, um, Brother Ju Singh and some brothers in KL came up with the idea of why don't we do it as a evening sharing. And Subang Jaya was the group that took up the challenge and they started with the very first and from there, it, it grew and involved, um, I think I last count, 16 various Buddhist societies around the country. Yeah. Actually, it was a very good um, sharing because I've um, somewhat read some of your, the, the title of the book. It's very uh, compact. And, uh, but then with the evening sharing, you actually expanded further. So we actually could, could, could get some understanding on what it means and where you are coming from and also uh, uh, wider knowledge about what is Buddhism is all about and also the teachings yeah it's always you stress about the teachings and it's not a religion and not based on a faith um, well, here yeah. I must add, Sister Eileen, that uh, the book is written in a very compact manner for a good reason. It yeah. was actually at the request of Brother Ju Singh yeah. because 2016, when I did the first book, I wrote in great detail. Mm -hmm. If you look at 2016, Walking in the Buddha's Footprints, what is in that book is really written in great detail and I took great pain to make sure nothing is missed and everything was put in. Yep. But Brother Ju Singh came back and said, nobody read books like that. I mean, they will read the first chapter and give up because it's too detailed. So he came up with the idea that it must not be thicker than a reader's digest book and the articles must not be longer than the reader digest article. So he said, it must be very brief, very terse and to the point. If not nowadays, this generation will not read. And that's why the Breaking Myth book was intentionally designed that way. Very brief, very terse, and to the point. Well, at the evening talks, I, of course, I took the opportunity to expand on it. Yeah, it's very true because uh, the younger, generation, younger, uh, younger generations right now, they have a shorter attention span, frankly. And for me, I would prefer, and also we are running a busy lives. For us, one slide, says it all <laughs> as an <laughs> overview will be better <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No point at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but then of course with that slide itself with an overview you expand it with clear explanation i think it's fine it's fine so that is what the presentation is all about with an overview so but then this is what we need to uh, understand what's the trend of the young mm. and they have very short attention span so this is something that is uh, true in that sense. Yeah. And we, we also can notice uh, them cannot sit long <laughs> to, <laughs> to, 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 to hear what you are, are talking about. Okay. So we have also uh, received quite a number of our questions and we have uh, selectively um, comes down to uh, eight uh, main questions that we think we should uh, share. Uh, with the uh, audience, yeah. So uh, at this moment, uh, let us start with uh, uh, one of the questions that we received that they mentioned that are uh, cultural practices harmful to the image of Buddha? He didn't teach us to do this. We should perform wholesome deeds and share the merits with all the beings. Is this not a better option on showing our gratitude? Is this not the true teachings of the Buddha? I think that's very relevant because um, lots of rites and rituals have entered into the organized religion called 
activism. And also, of course, inevitably, lots of cultural practices have gone in, some of which are completely harmless, educational, while some may in fact be harmful and so should be abandoned. So let us start by realizing that when the Buddha taught the Buddha Dharma, there were hardly any rites and rituals. In fact, if anything, um, the Buddha was a great revisionist of his time and he was against a lot of things that people did, rites and rituals simply out of faith or belief or mere hope. And for example, there were rituals that are clearly documented that the Buddha went against quite vocally in the Ali Canon. For example, he was against sacrifices of animals. He was talking about the futility of bathing in rivers that are deemed holy, etc. So in our current practice today, if let's say I am a new person to the Buddha Dharma and I walked into a Buddhist temple of any lineage in Malaysia or Singapore, I would see a lot of rituals. And starting with, for example, um, something very common like picking refuge, picking the five precepts. Uh, these are in fact good, picking refuge, picking the five precepts are in fact described within the Kali Canon itself in the lifetime of the Buddha. But if we go beyond that, there are also many other rites and rituals which are completely not found anywhere in the Canon. And let me put it to you this way. Some of these were purposely designed by our forebears because they have an educational purpose. They were designed to educate in an era where people were not so educated, where people depended on a lot of visual cues mm. and depended on a lot of things to give them psychological comfort. Just again, for example, we offer fruits, we offer incense, we offer all kinds of things. And the reality is that the Buddha is not going to eat them. Neither is anyone beyond the people who bring it back home to eat them. But that offering, for example, served an educational purpose. The offering of flowers, teachers, yeah. no matter how beautiful, it's a very important lesson of impermanence. The offering of fruits tell us the lesson of cause and effect from the seed will come the fruit. The offering of incense tells us that how your good deeds will be like incense that will be so fragrant to everyone, etc. But often people have forgotten the reason behind these educational tools and then depend on these offerings or rites as the means to get awakening or to get something. In which case then it is wrong. And the Buddha clearly stated that if you are dependent on rites and rituals for you to gain awakening, then that is definitely a wrong view. And it is in fact one of the factors that a Sotapanna will overcome in his education, in his search for truth. But there are also rites and rituals which are completely harmless and which are not described by the Buddha himself, but which gives people a lot of psychological comfort. And again, I will give you an example within Orthodox Buddhism. You go to Sikha Inn, for example, at the end of the service, Venerable goes round picking water with a flower and sprinkle on everyone. You're not going to find that anywhere in the tent. All right, the chanting of Paritas is something so common, so accepted that people take it for granted. But where in the canon are you ever going to find that? So does it play no role? Most people, if not all, barely understand the words that is being chanted by the venerable. And when I hear the word but one, two, Sabah Mangalam, I know it's time to eat. So that's the only good thing. <laughs> it's time to eat. Makan time is near. So most people look at that as, ah, it's a blessing. Ah, the water has fallen on me. So now that's a rite and a ritual. If you think that that is going to solve your problems, you're going to be slightly mistaken. Yeah, but true. there is a lot of people who requires that psychological comfort. So while I would say, yes, it is definitely a rites and a ritual which we have to grow out of as we learn more and more about the Buddha Dharma. 
we also have to understand that there are a lot of people at different stages of this path. And some people require such things for psychological comfort. So while it is a rites and a rituals, while it is not going to help us with awakening, it certainly provides comfort and maybe even fulfill much of the needs of a person who is starting on his journey who needed that help. So a lot of cultural practices, for example, if you visit a Mahayana temple, you will see the drum and the bell, which a long time ago, I'm very sure served the purpose of telling time because it's a morning service and evening service where they will use the drum and the bell. And that would tell people of the time and of the starting of a service. But now everybody has a handphone which tells time. We don't even need to wear a watch anymore. Yeah, but true that, also, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, but that practice drum. continues. If you walk into a Mahayana temple, you will still yeah. see the drum and the bell yeah, being rung true. for evening Not and morning services. Yeah. So that's culture. Is mm. that harmful? I don't think it does any harm. I mean, but of course, it has become very ceremonial nowadays. Yeah. Similarly, Chinese New Year, you serve tea to your seniors. Mm. That's not described anywhere in the Buddha Dharma, but it's, I think, a good practice because it teaches us to respect our seniors. I still offer tea on the altar for my ancestors. It's a gesture of respect. I'm not praying to them. I'm showing my respect that I stand today on their shoulders, mm. their sacrifices, their hard work. And I think that that, that gratitude is something the Buddha taught. The Buddha expressed gratitude when he became enlightened by showing gratitude to the Bodhi tree. So we too show our gratitude in different cultural ways. In the Chinese way, it is by offering tea, for example, by remembering our departed relatives on Qingming, on the days where we honor them in our own home autumn, etc. So these are good practices, which I think do no harm and has to be maintained. But of course, there are also controversial practices like releasing fish, releasing animals, which yeah. a lot of it is abused, as you know. Yeah. So some of those we really have to ask ourselves honestly, should I do it? I think that at our present understanding of ecology, maybe that should not be done because um, we are probably or possibly doing more harm to the environment and to the animal. Yeah, because to me, I, I find it actually we are inviting more traits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, inviting more, more traits. Yeah, because we are, uh, we are inviting uh, people to catch more pigeon. Yeah. And then you just release for the sake of releasing, but you need to be caught again. Yeah. So, so to me, I say like um, make no sense. Um, I mean, this is just my personal uh, experience because I've uh, partake once, but then I I I look into different um perspective is like but then we are actually inviting more trades getting people more to you know catch more fish catch more uh, birds just to just to release it i i, I find it yes it's, it's just against my principle in the end so uh after that i i do not want to partake anything of it I agree but I, it. I just silently observe i say well i can only tell my my uh my my friends and say you you all think for yourself but uh, mm. for me i will not do it uh then then whether they accept my explanation i i just leave it to them i, I of course. you you need to apply your wisdom need the zi hui, mm. you know so so yeah. that's that's how i i i told them about it yes after yeah. all the buddha dharma is all about wisdom yeah correct correct mm. and uh also i received the next question about a concern uh, female uh, devotees uh, obviously, we females are the weaklings uh, between, I mean, compared to uh, a male uh, as in the gender. She, she put it that way. Ladies are soft-hearted and men tempted to bully ladies, especially in workplace. I think not only just workplace, I would say in domestic affairs, in domestic affairs, yeah, and despite the huge amounts of teachings have been uh, channeled to society, right? Um, is there any other way to repair this uh, situation or how the ladies is to deal with facing this kind of situation? So I believe that many of our female devotees out there, um, I will put that as perhaps sometimes they are suffering in silence mm. or perhaps physical abuse. We won't know. Right, so I've seen a lot. 
I seen a lot, frankly. So how would your best advice given to these uh, female uh, devotees or others that is facing this situation? I think that the Buddha Dharma is probably one of the more, uh, I would say, advanced philosophies when it comes to equality of women. 2,600 years ago, when the Buddha walked the earth, women had very, very lowly status. Women had status quite clearly subservient to men. But yet the Buddha treated women quite out of the ordinary. First, the Buddha gave women the Dhamma equally as he gave the men. It is not, oh, I only teach the men, the women I don't teach. No such thing. He taught both male, female disciples the exact same thing. And he made it very clear to Ananda that women have the equal opportunity of awakening as any man. No difference. They had the equal opportunity to be awakened, which means that the ability or the capability of a woman to acquire the wisdom necessary for awakening is equal, if not superior to a man. We do not know if it is superior or not, but it is at the very least equal to that of a man. And of course, all of you are quite familiar with the fact that he allowed the female Sangha, despite the obvious difficulties of 2,600 years ago, where it would be absolutely unthinkable for a woman to leave home by herself, not be under anybody and live an independent life. It would be absolutely unthinkable to be very realistic, even in today's India, it is quite unthinkable, let alone 2,600 years ago. And yet a female Sangha started. Well, of course, to protect the female Sangha, the Buddha had to include rules like it has to be next to him. A monastery has to be not deep in the forest, etc., etc. These, these are obvious social and security reasons to protect the female Sangha. But he allowed it and he gave them equal opportunity. And if you look at the Terigata, you see a lot of very inspiring stories of how these nuns became awakened. Now, what about even in terms of language? I do not know how many people are aware, but if you look, the Buddha always say, Mata Pitunam. Whenever he addressed parents or mothers and fathers, the Buddha always addressed mothers first. Mata Pitunam. Even when you chant your metta chanting, it's Mata Pitunam. Mother and father. It's always mother first. He gave women that respect and that standing. And of course, almost everyone I think are familiar when King Kasanadi of Kosala's wife gave birth to a daughter. He was a bit depressed. And the Buddha was the one who counseled him. And no, 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 a daughter might be the best thing. He might give birth. She might be a good wife and he might even give birth to a huge, great king in the future. So do not look down. Now, let's come forward to the 21st century. I think men are the ones who are in trouble in the 21st century. Let me just tell you in my medical class that I teach, the ladies and the male ratio is three to one. Three ladies, one male. The boys got no, absolutely no lack of choice of girlfriends. So many, <laughs> three to one, unthinkable. When I was in med school, it was probably three boys to one girl. So the world is changing. The women are playing very, very dominant roles. And in the countries in which COVID-19 is well controlled, they're all ruled by women. Look at New Zealand. Ah, right. <laughs> Look at Germany. Ah, right, ruled by right. women. The countries ruled by men are in big trouble. <laughs> so I think that as we go on to the 21st century, males are the ones who are going to be progressively threatened. <laughs> Um, the vice chancellor, sorry, the, 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 the main leaders of so many corporations nowadays are ladies, including many universities. So 
women are definitely making great strides as far as intellectual work is concerned, as far as um, many professions traditionally not within their area, including business. But we have to be realistic that women and men do have physical dif differences. Yeah. Men are physically, genetically bigger by their software. Men have, of course, some other jobs which are more suitable for the male gender. And I mean, for example, if you're looking at an elite uh, fireman squad or something like that, I'm, I think that a man would probably be a better job. And I, I don't think a woman will want to fight for a role in an in a elite fireman team that is going up skyscrapers to save people because by their very physical build, men are probably more suitable. Just as women are very suitable as caregivers because of their compassionate, gentle nature. Some men are simply not so gentle. So while there are many areas which we need to say, yes, there should be equality and there must be equality, including uh, marital rights, divorce rights, et cetera, which I think we are making good progress. There are also many areas whereby if I'm a woman, I wouldn't want to fight with a man. I, I, I like the men to continue to do that job because they're physically mm -hmm. more capable. But what but, is in the Buddha Dharma is that the Buddha did not discriminate. Right? Sorry, Eileen. Yeah, but I think uh, in this uh, current society, we ladies are more prone to, uh, you know, uh, verbal sexual harassment. Of course, yeah. I, I, I do not so, deny that. Yeah, so I was like, I think that could be uh, another bully in terms of, of that. So that is why we say that, you know, men are tempted to bully ladies in terms of that sense. Yeah, so, and uh, we also experience, uh, we, uh, I see in real case example, you know, uh, we female tends to keep quiet after being done so and hope that it will not be repeated. But uh, again, we thought it could repair the situation, but men are just still, still advancing. Well, I think times are definitely changing. Yep. If you look back, let's say 30, 40 years, I would say ladies have already made remarkable progress. Remarkable. But mm. let us come back to the Buddha Dharma because mm. I think that it is important for ladies to realize that one, the Buddha Dharma is something that gave ladies equal opportunity for advancement right from the very beginning. Of course, some of you might question about why the additional Vinaya rules that are found in the ladies orders when Ananda appealed. Now, there's a lot of controversy there, including that section, whether that section is in fact said by the Buddha or added in by subsequent generations of people. We actually do not know, but I'm sure those of you who are interested, you can research it up and you will see that apparently when what I read the language, the texture of that section is quite different from what precedes it. And so there are people who actually wonder whether that whole section was actually added in subsequently. Now, of course, in a traditional society, and this is still true today, ladies have a disadvantage. But things are changing. And please, I think we should not forget that if you and I is to walk into any temple in Malaysia today, I think of whatever lineage, who are the people who are doing the hard work supporting the center? Of course, there are a lot of good men doing it, but you will find a lot of women. Lot of women. Yeah. They are yeah. truly the pillars supporting the whole structure. And I think for that, we must give them credit. Yeah. And I must say that if you compare the Buddha Dharma to let's say other major world religions, you will see that the Buddha Dharma is relatively free. All right, we do not have that many restrictions on where a woman must stand, where a woman must sit, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of things that do exist, they actually culture, man-made, not really part of what is taught by the Buddha. Mm. All right, and questions, of course, people raise, oh, can a lady devotee clean the Buddha image? Can a lady devotee wipe the main altar? Oh, well, there are some very conservative people who say, no, 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 cannot, only a man will. And sometimes I've been asked that question, can I wipe the main altar? Can I clean the main Buddha image? I say, when you finish, you can come to my house and do mine too if you have time. 
because I do not see any reason why not. Right? <laughs> okay. Right. There's another question. Um, Buddhism has different sects now. Oh, these yeah sections yeah um so does any monks practice combination of few sects together like Theravada Sutta together with Chinese Mahayana Sutta and does the lay person also advisable to practice a combination of this together yeah, that's a very good question well let me put it this way to start you mean the Buddha did not teach any Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, whatever Dhyana. The Buddha only taught the Buddha Dharma. It is we humans, subsequent generations, who created so many Yanas. And well, the divisions are man made. The Buddha did not, and I repeat, did not create any Yana. He only taught the Buddha Dharma. While for the majority of us who are English educated, what is easily accessible to us who are English educated is of course the Pali Canon, because that was translated into English a hundred years ago. Mm. And so many of us are familiar with the Pali Canon because of that. Now, if I'm not English educated, I might be more drawn to the Mahayana tradition, for example. But because I'm English educated, my Dhamma studies started with the Pali Canon. Now, a Chinese educated person might be naturally more drawn to the Mahayana tradition because most of their literature is in Chinese. So a lot of it is by our cultural influence and by our education. But let me again emphasize, the Buddha did not teach any yanas. The Buddha only taught the Dhamma. And I give myself as an example that while I study the Pali Canon. I read literature with regards to the Pali Canon. I am very inspired and I learned a lot from the Heart Sutra, which is a Mahayana writing. Yeah, I was about to ask you that, Xin Jing, <laughs> because and, you also, <laughs> you yeah. also um, teach uh, a little bit about the Xin Jing. So I was thinking, eh, is uh, Dr. Punya actually a... Uh, is Chinese educated or bilingual as usual? Well, the same thing is extremely profound and it mm. challenges you. So yeah. if you attempt to understand it bit by bit by bit, you actually have a much more profound understanding mm. of the Buddha Dharma because within the same thing are almost all the Theravada core teachings. They are included mm. inside. And some more, for example, if you study the Diamond Sutra, you also understand much better the concepts of anicca, anatta, dukkha. The Diamond Sutra explains it, if you understand the intricacy of its language, very, very well. And furthermore, for example, from Chan stories, you learn a lot of Buddha Dharma. Mm. So basically what I'm interested in is, of course, in the Buddha Dharma. I'm not so interested whether oh, it's a Theravada teaching mm. or it's a Mahayana teaching or it's a Vajrayana teaching. And that to me is immaterial because Dhamma is Dhamma. Truth is truth. And of course, I get into trouble with the purists. They get very angry with me and they say, this fellow has gone deviant or whatever. But that's all right because everybody searches for the truth in his own way. The purists will disagree. Yep. But let me put it to you another way, Ilin. Let's say you are a purist strictly, strictly only Theravada or Mahayana or Vajrayana, not Go by one the books. inch, <laughs> one inch above. Now you have to realize, for example, within Theravada practices, Parita chanting, I'm sure you, you're familiar, so beloved of Theravada practice, all right? Not many people are aware that Parita chanting in the Theravada tradition is a result of Mahayana influence. Mm. Not many people are aware of that, mm. that it is actually Mahayana influence which resulted in Parita chantings in the Theravada tradition. All right, so, well, so we are actually practicing cross things without even realizing it in many ways. And also please remember within Mahayana, all the Pali scriptures are called the Agamas and most of them are actually found in there. All right, in the Agamas, so you have Chang, Ahanting, 
you have Cha A Han Jing, Cha I A Han Jing, Chung A Han Jing, all the Diga Nikaya, Majima Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya, Samyutta Nikaya, they are all there in under the Agamas. So let me put it this way, if Yilin, you are to meet me now for the first time and you ask Dr. Wong, what lineage are you? My answer to you will be Hahayana. <laughs> I follow the Buddha Dharma because I want to be happy. happy yeah. My lineage okay, okay. Hahayana. That's a very Whatever good brings me to the ultimate goal of supreme happiness. Mm. And I, I see truth in all this. And that's why I try not to divide my mind into, oh, this is Mahayana teaching, this is Theravada teaching. I think that that is very artificial because within the 84,000 Dharma doors, and again, the instant I say 84,000 Dharma doors, good friends, dear Dharma family who are very pure will say, ha, ah, 84,000 Dharma doors, that's a Mahayana teaching. Pa wan si chen fa man. <laughs> Says who? It's actually a Theravada teaching. Are you aware of that? I can mm. give you the exact quotation. I... <laughs> I would think that so because uh, Chinese uh, uh, words, right, um, very straightforward. Yeah, mm. uh, uh, we call it pusen pumie in very four character words, right? But in English, you have to describe it in words and sentence. <laughs> then you tell. So sometimes I find that you know those who are bilingual are actually very uh, to the advantage of knowing the two. Yeah. So so uh uh, bui kong kong bui se. So so straightforward yeah but so it takes one lifetime to understand that one yeah line. exactly exactly <laughs> but in 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 uh in english translation text right you need a book it was like wow you, you you need to understand uh what does it mean and and, and things yeah. like that so i was like okay sometimes uh, chinese uh, explain it clearer like for yeah. example the meta thing the jitta thing and then you seen and yeah it it, it it distinguished but in english it's just like we call it as grandfather, but Chinese will say a wai gong, wai po, you know, wai gong, wai po, 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 gong, gong. We have a distinction, but in, in English, it's just Everyone's grandfather. An uncle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Grand uncles and uncles. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so we, I think we, you, you're right. We just look into what, what gives you the true uh, teachings. Yeah, 84,000 teachings, don't forget, yeah, eight yeah. noble. Eightfold yeah. path, four noble tropes, three mm. universal characteristics. Mm. I say that at nauseum. Mm. Eight four zero zero zero. Yeah. While True. there are eighty four thousand dharma doors, eighty four thousand dharma teachings, as Ananda said in the Taragata, these eighty four thousand dharma doors lead ultimately to the core mm. of the noble eightfold path, the four noble truths, and the three universal characteristics. Because after all. The first five disciples of the Buddha became awakened based on the teachings of the middle path, the mm. four noble truths, the eightfold yeah. path, and the three universal yeah, characteristics. Yeah, That's the core teaching. Correct. Everything else is icing on the cake. The yep. core teaching is that. Yep. All right. Okay. So that's another question. Uh, in the final episode of the Breaking Myth series, Are You Free? We learned that the Buddha's Dharma is the way to ultimate freedom. How do we know that the Buddha got it right? He rejected the Jain path of self-mortification and he rejected the Vedic view of the Atman. So how do you know he's right? And yeah. that's where Ehi Pasiko comes in. Mm -hmm. see, but Ehi Pasiko means come and experience. Often you will see it's translated as come and see, it's actually not come and see, it's actually come and experience. Yeah. Just like all of us here come and experience, experience. the Dhamma Correct. and see, is what the Buddha taught true. You've got to see it for yourself. No one can tell it to you because if I were to tell it to you and you believe me, that is just believing in my words. But you've got to come and experience it for yourself. Is the Buddha's teachings on dukkha? Are his teachings on the way to get out of dukkha? Are this true? And let me put it to you this way. If let's say tomorrow, I by some reason, somebody point a gun to my head and say that if you do not convert to some other religion, not only you will be shot dead, Eileen will be shot dead, Wei will be shot dead, Yu Sing will be shot dead, all of you will be shot dead. Now you think that that might be ridiculous, huh? but it actually happened in history. All right, and uh, conquistas in South America, the British in Sri Lanka, 
such horrors happened that many, many people were forcibly converted. That's why literally everyone in Sri Lanka has an Angmo name nowadays, because a lot of forced conversion. So let's say all four of us, somebody point a gun to our head and say, if you don't do it, we're going to kill everyone in your family. And you're not going to have a job. You're not going to have an education. You can't do anything. So we're all forced to convert to some other religion, like XYZ yeah. religion. Mm. But will you be able to believe or trust or accept what XYZ religion tells you? It is unlikely that any one of us four here, even though we might have to officially convert, is going to accept that because you know. You have reached a stage, Sister Elaine, Brother Ju Singh, Brother Whaley, where you are no longer walking on faith. You do not walk on belief. You do not walk because somebody said so. But you are walking this path because you know this path to be correct. So once you have done that, you have ehi pasiko, you have come, you have experienced, and you have known what the Buddha talked about, anicca, impermanence, dukkha, stress, discomfort, emo, and anatta, non-self, you know it's true. And no one else is going to be able to tell you that it is not true. And you know that things come by cause and effect. Any physicist will tell you the same thing. So things are not just going to come up just because you prayed for it. It has to come because of cause and effect. And when you realize all these things, then it is no longer faith. Sada is so often translated as faith, but actually Sada is confidence. Now you have genuine Sada, Sister Elin, not faith in the Buddha, but confidence. You are confident that what the Buddha has taught us is correct because you have a hipasiko. You have seen it and you have experienced it for yourself. You know it is true. There's nothing to believe. So when you understand that, when you know that, then there is no question of another philosophy, another faith coming in and then saying, oh, is the Buddha correct? Is the Buddha not correct? If you still are at the stage where is the Buddha correct or is the Buddha not correct, that means you have actually not really understood his teachings, nor have you grasped the effects of understanding his teaching on your life. I mean, let me put it this way. Why are the followers sitting here? We could be shopping somewhere if MCO allows. We could be doing so many things. So why are the followers sitting here? Why is it that at an instant I can see Alex really using contacted me and say, okay, we're going to start up close and personal. Why? Why are we doing it? Why are we not doing other things? Well, I think that the answer is very simple. All of us here have a hipasiko. We have come and experience. We know it. And that's why the focus, the direction of our lives are completely different. We have decided that this is the way out of suffering. And we are back where we can do what we can as soon as possible. All right, sister? Thank you. Um, this question, I hope that I could uh, post it uh, to you in my very best understanding. Um, the question is that, isn't it a core doctrine of the Dharma that beings are reborn? And uh, uh, this uh, question relates to, you know, uh, isn't it that the very knowledge of the truth of rebirth in the Buddha's ability to recall the past lives? Is, is this true? Well, if we look at what is written in the canon about the Buddha on the night of his enlightenment, you will see that the Buddha described him looking backwards and seeing previous states of existence up to over 90 yons of existence, which is a really very, very long time. And he could, in fact, say, in this life I was like that, in that life I was like that, etc. Now, in the time of the Buddha, the prevailing concept where Maganda, Kosala is, basically North East India, is that you have got this Atta, some concrete, unchanging, eternal being inside us, inside Elin, inside Juicing. And that when Elin, Juicing departs, this Atta will go on and go into another body and go on and go into another body. And that 
atta going from one body to another body to another body until it merges with the ultimate is something which will go on at infinitum. But it is this one atta, a concrete, unchanging, solid substance of some sort which is indestructible, which is why it can burn in hell, it can go to heaven, it can have all kinds of things, but still remain indestructible. That concept of atta is something the Buddha disagreed. Because when the Buddha looked very, very clearly in himself, in his past, he could not see anything which is concrete like that. And that's why you have words like transmigration, which means from here, this thing transmigrated here. And that's wrong. That's not applicable to the Buddha Dharma. And then you have words like reincarnation, which actually also means something reincarnate or reincarnate into another being and also wrong. Yeah, so because then... in my because in, in my in my early days, um, um you know, before I when I was a teenage, the popular word to use was reincarnation, not rebirth as in now, you know. Mm. So so then again, my my relatives will talk about, uh, you know, your Buddhists are talking about uh reincarnation. I mean, of course, they don't believe in 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 such. So, but then at that point, I was still young. I don't know what is the what what does it mean by reincarnation? If you tell me it's rebirth, then I understood it very direct <laughs> that it is rebirth, right? So yeah. so yeah, again, it's 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 the interchangeability of 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 term use. So we don't know which is which. No, because words carry baggage. Yeah, yeah, Each yeah. Each word true, has true. a baggage. So when yeah, you say yeah. transmigration, yeah, transmigration, or reincarnation, yeah, it carries correct. with it a baggage. Yeah. So we say these two are not applicable. Yeah. So then we, we are left with one more word, rebirth. Soul. Rebirth. Oh, soul also. <laughs> ah, yeah, I mean, okay. La. So soul has a big baggage from Western concept. Oh, okay. The body's but the enemy, we are stuck with the word rebirth. Yeah, okay, yeah, with, yeah. For lack of a better word, yeah, yeah, we are stuck yeah, with yeah. the word rebirth. And so yeah. we say, okay, la, seems the least harmful of all the three words. La. So we are stuck with the word rebirth. That this mm. person, is reborn oh. again to another person. Yeah. Now, there's a very important sutta in the canon in which there's a venerable, his name is Sati. Venerable Sati went around teaching that it is this consciousness, consciousness or awareness, which will go and into another one. And after that, this person died, then this consciousness will go and come out and enter another one. And all his fellow monks went and told him, no, 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 that's not what the Buddha taught. The Buddha did not teach that. Sati was unmoved. Then these people raised this issue to the Buddha. And the Buddha said, can you call Venerable Sati to see me? So Sati was called in the presence of the Buddha. But the Buddha actually asked him, if you look at that very interesting sutta, the Buddha asked him, what is it that you teach? And then he actually describes how this consciousness will move. And the Buddha very clearly told him that he is wrong. But surprise, surprise, surprise. Sati is unconvinced, you know. Even with the Buddha telling him. All right, Sati was unconvinced, which is interesting. I mean, so here you have the teacher telling me, and yet I'm unconvinced. So what is wrong then with that concept? But Sati's concept is that the consciousness is like something concrete, unchanging, going on and on and on. Well, the Buddha in that pretty long sutta actually explains that consciousness will change. It's not something static. Your awareness is always changing, always evolving, depending on what you are aware of. Now, so then what, what are we then left with? Now, I, I think that in the 21st century, I prefer a word called recycle, that when I die, I will be recycled. As we know from physics, energy can never be created, nor can energy be destroyed. Energy can only be transformed into a different state, depending on the conditions. So. When any one of us here die, we are going to be recycled into various forms, into various forms. So the Lego block, which I used in the Breaking Myth series, was I thought a wonderful thing because if you look at a, a toy made up of Lego blocks, mm. okay, let's say it's a toy train made of Lego blocks, which Eileen very happily plays with. Now, I dismantle that and I put it back into a box, and I ask Eileen, Eileen, where's your toy train? And Elin said, it's in the Lego box. Then I open the Lego box and show Elin, no, you have no toy train in there. 
all you have are Lego bricks. Yeah, correct. So then Elena said, what happened to my toy train? Then I take the same Lego blocks, now I make a toy house. And I say, your toy train has now become a toy house. Toy house. Mm. So that is my present understanding of the rebirth or recycling process. That when a person dies, then depending on our karma, depending on our conditions, the energy that is you and me cannot be created nor destroyed, as you know from physics. It can only be transformed. And that transformation into the various states is the future. And similarly, if you go backwards, it goes back at infinitum. Some venerables have taught me using the analogy of a river. They say, you look at a river with the water rushing and gushing. The water is never the same. Two seconds later, the water has changed. Three seconds later, it has changed. Mm -hmm. It's always changing, changing and evolving and evolving. Yeah. And so that was one example, one particular venerable taught me. And another venerable taught me using flowers. He said, look at the garden. So let's say now you look at your garden. And he said, all the things that we do are like the seeds that we plant. So let's say Eileen does a lot of good things, plant a lot of beautiful seeds, of course, some weeds here and there, and then she, she, she see some naughty movie on Netflix. So there are a few weeds which appear here and there. But generally, she plants lots of nice flowers, pandan leaf and all that. So at the end of the day, what is the garden she gets? So she gets a garden which is beautiful, which is nice. That garden is created by Eileen, but that garden is always changing. Tomorrow, Eileen decides to mow that whole garden down and plant something else. Well, yeah. that's Eileen's choice. And so we are creating our future just like we are planting these seeds in the garden. Yeah. I thought that was another pretty good analogy taught by another venerable. He said, we are always planting, so it's always changing. That garden is not a static garden. Unlike the concept of an atta, that garden is not a static garden. It's always changing depending on what we do. Right. So I hope that I have, in a sense, answered that question. It's a very profound question because I've been asked the same question many, many times. It's a very profound question. It's, it's understanding finally would help you understand anatta, why there is non-self. All right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, the, the next question is actually more about miracles. Yeah, so I've uh, actually compiled a few of these questions is into one topic. In episode eight, sneaking away in the middle of the night, Dr. Wong spoke about facts and legends in the Buddhist uh, traditions. They were stories of the younger generation having doubts uh, due to the presence of miracles and supernatural powers in the tradition. Yeah? One of the epithets of the Buddha is Sata Deva Manusanam, Manusanam, the teacher of gods and humans. The suttas feature him and his disciples traveling to the heavenly realms to preach the Dharma. So this sounds miracle and supernatural to us, right? So the fact that they could even communicate and interact with the devas already sounds quite out of this world to me. So could these teachings uh, create doubts? In fact, myself, actually, when I, when, I, when I hear about the life of the Buddha, um, when he was born, you know, um, and then he could walk steps, <laughs> seven steps, and, you know, even talk about um the last it will be the my last birth and things like that so it it actually was like is it true or not <laughs> so so i i'm sure quite a lot of uh um those free thinker will also think the same those are more non the buddhists also say in hey, your um, this is more about the legend how i i i think i think uh, in my perspective right um not 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 to mention about uh, the faith in particular but they seems to believe more in their faith like for example we also talk about um uh one of the uh the the, the legends about splitting the sea and let the ship move and uh, um having the living uh, creatures uh, and bought it safely yeah so so they tend to have that kind of a belief more than what we heard um, in the uh, 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 in the Buddha's uh, uh, sharing about what we had like uh, supernatural uh, flowers, psychic, uh, supernatural uh, power and the psychic 
uh, that the Buddha has, you know, can know. So, so yeah, it's always creating doubts even to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Eileen. I think it's a very important question because about 20 years ago, if not more, one of my supporters and good friends went on the pilgrimage to India, the Buddhist pilgrimage. And while he was there, then a local Indian guide who was picking them around spoke of all kinds of miraculous things as they visited this site and that site and here, what happened, over there, what happened. He was so put off by it that he almost became another religion. So when he came back, he wrote to me and he said, he described to me about all these miracles which are so preposterous. And he said that if there is one way to drive another person or a person to another religion is just listen to these stories. And he, he appealed to me, in fact, can I do something? Now, it is difficult to do something because this is so ingrained into our popular culture. But I think that you have to be very clear on a few things. Just this morning, I was learning something from one philosopher called Professor Sopenhauser, who has, of course, passed away. He was in the 1800s. But he was a very interesting philosopher because he wrote a lot of things about religion. And he compared the different religions and gave his comments. And he was a very brilliant man, no doubt. But one of the things we must know and realize, not just within Buddhism, the religion, but with any religion, all right? Now, I will, of course, only talk about the Buddhism. I'm not going to venture into the others. Yeah. But within Buddhism, we have to be clear when we read what is the life of the Buddha. There's a lot of material in the Buddhist canon with regards to the life of the Buddha. And if you read this material, you will see that the Buddha is a very human human. Yeah. In the canon, it even talks of him having to relieve himself past motion, past urine. And it talks of him having back a. It talks of him being too tired and asking another venerable to give the Dhamma talk on his behalf. All right, it shows him having abdominal pain, diarrhea, very human, human. Now, that is the human Buddha. Yep. Then as you read, you will also find, and I'm talking about canon, uh, I'm not talking about the legends. Uh. Yeah. Forget about the biographies of the Buddha, which are written hundreds of years later, like Buddha Charita and all that. Those are written at least 500 years after the Buddha's passing away. And which each generation, they made him more and more unhuman, more and more divine. Yeah. But True. even within the Buddhist canon, you will see this happening. That people introduced things which made him look very, very powerful, very miraculous. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the prevailing culture and beliefs of that time. For example, if you look at the Diga Nikaya in a sutta called the, uh, the Lakana, which means science, uh, Lakana means science, the Lakana sutta, you will see that the Buddha's physical attributes are described such that he is almost like an alien. He doesn't even look human at all. Almost, if you believe that, he's almost like an alien. You know? But when you look at the other parts of the canon, you will see that the Buddha looked exactly like you and me. Mm. For example, when King Ajatasattu was brought by the good doctor to see the Buddha, King Ajatasattu could not tell from among the seated group of monks who is the Buddha. And he had to be pointed out by the good doctor that, oh, this is the Buddha. So that one tells us he didn't look any different from the other monks. And another time where a few of his close disciples were meditating in the forest, and I can't remember if it's a forest or a park, but there was a caretaker, presumably either bringing them food or something. And the Buddha actually was passing by and he walked in to visit these people who were meditating in there. And the caretaker, stop the Buddha and say, no, you cannot go in to see them. They are practicing. Now that tells me, obviously, the Buddha doesn't come with flying, with light shining out of his head and multiple lights emanating from his head. Because if he's like that, no gatekeeper is going to stop him. But the gatekeeper told him, no, you can't go in. Now there's another 
very interesting Sutta Kota, where it described a, van, a man called Puku Sati. Puku Sati was a venerable who was very determined to meet the Buddha. He studied the Dhamma from the Buddha's disciples, but he has personally never met the Buddha. So he heard that the Buddha was somewhere and then he was traveling to visit. Now the Buddha was traveling also along the same way and the Buddha actually stopped at this cow shed and asked the permission to stay the night for which he was given. And then Pukusati came and Pukusati asked for permission and he was also given. So the two of them actually shared that cow shed for the night and went into a deep conversation. And Pukusati thought that this man was another monk who studied the, the Dharma. And they engaged in conversation the whole night without Pukusati realizing that it's the Buddha. And it is only when Pukusati realized the depth of this man's understanding and perception that he felt, hey, something is wrong. Eh? And that's when the Buddha actually revealed that I'm your teacher, the Buddha. So the, there are many, many instances like that in the canon, which actually tells us that the Buddha was just looking like you and me, another human being, without all that additional thing that we added in. So the life of the Buddha is there in the canon if you want to look at it. Mm. Then the legends, yep. a lot of legends which are added in even within the canon. And if you go from Dhammapada, for example, which is one of the more early books, the Sutta Nipata, for example, you will find hardly any of miracles or hardly any magic. And then as you go on to Anguttara Nikaya, then to Samyutta, then to Majima, then to Diga, you find more and more editing and more and more miraculous things. Because I think that the early writers wanted to make people think of the Buddha as greater than their gods, greater than whoever they were mm. worshipping. And they made use of this cultural influence and added in all these Steven Spielberg effects. So I think that as students of the Buddha Dharma, that while you be begin being very impressed by the imagery on almost all temple walls, after a while, as you walk this path, you begin to realize that a lot of it is allegory for a public that is possibly uneducated and possibly needed all these graphics and visuals to help them. Now, if you are to strictly teach the Buddha Dharma, then you're only going to be entertaining a group of philosophers of which there are going to be very few. Mm. But you still need to fulfill the needs of the many. And the needs mm. of the many are not going to be the ones who understand what is Paticca Samuppada. Are not going to be the ones who understand very profound teachings. Which is why if you look at how the Buddha taught, for example, he taught Yasa. He began by good deeds, good karma, bad deeds, bad karma. He taught him the results of cause and effect. He in fact taught him about heavenly rewards, etc. Mm -hmm. And only when Yasa was ready, did he talk about the middle path, did he talk about the higher teachings. So we have to realize that the Buddha's teachings is a graduated teaching. So while all these very interesting stories may have served an educational purpose. Some people think that the seven steps he took, each with a lotus flower that Sister Eileen referred to, refers to the fact of the seven factors of enlightenment. All right, that it was actually an allegory that the Buddha had these seven factors of enlightenment fulfilled. Now, they are, the allegory and educational purpose may have long been forgotten but people remember the miracles for what it is. But let us be very frank about it. If you look at the whole flow, then the Buddha is a very human man who had abdominal pain, who fell sick, who needed a doctor, and he got injured. He was a teacher for whom some villagers rejected and even blocked their wells to not allow him to take water to drink so that he would bypass their well, bypass their village etc. So I think that we are not ever going to get rid of the legends because I think most people are more familiar with the Buddha Charitas, the legends, than they are with the canon because it's yeah. easier to read nice stories. Yeah. So we're going to have to live with it. But I think that for a younger generation who are very inquisitive and very knowledgeable, it is important that they be able to tell the life versus the legends and the allegories that are in it. A lot of it are allegories which we need to clearly understand. Now, if you don't understand, 
then you actually degrade the Buddha into another godlike figure. And the Buddha is not a godlike figure. The Buddha right. is a teacher. All right. All right, Eileen, I hope that helps a bit. Thank you. So um, that's another question about uh, attachments. Yeah? So we compile a few questions into one category as well. How can we care about others and yet at the same time not attached about what happens to them? For example, filial children to their parents who don't observe five precepts, caring parents who worry about the future of children. Another one would be how to let go of addiction that is making the mind very agitated and suffering. Okay. Now, first and foremost, metta. Genuine metta karuna mudita upeka can only be practiced in its perfect way by someone who is enlightened, by someone who actually understands anatta. If not, whenever we do good deeds, wholesome deeds, there is always an element of what is it in there for me because we still have not fully understood anatta. We still have not fully understood non-self. And I quote, I learned this from a very close person. That on the day when Sister Eileen becomes awakened, truly awakened, Sister Eileen will realize that she hasn't done anything good for other people. All the good things she did for other people had a slight undertaking of what is it in there for me. So it's maybe 90%, 95%, but still there's still that 5% of what is it in there for me. There are not many people who are completely altruistic because if you are, you have truly understood non-self. And even this morning, I was just discussing with my wife and we're talking about metta. And I said that the Buddha gave the example of the love of a mother for her only child as closest among us mortals to the ideal of metta. And I reminded my wife, note, it is still a mother to her child. Why not to other children? Why not to someone completely unrelated? And that's because we still have not fully understood anatta. So one, metta. Metta is a little bit different from love. When one of my medical students love another medical student, it is because he likes what she is making him feel. She likes what he is making her feel. It is a basic mutual reassurance project. So that's why if he doesn't behave in a way that she mentally demands, it's the end of the relationship, why see versa? Because each has expectation that you have to behave in that way so that I feel good. And I similarly have to behave in that way so that you feel good. So it is what we call a conditional love, a very conditional love. What about the love of a mother for a child? It goes one step beyond. The child can be naughty. The child can be not so smart. But the mother will still love the child because it is her child. Yep. The child can even commit a crime. The mother will still love the child because it is her child. But what if it is not her child? Then it's a different story. So there is still an element of I in there, my child. Now, perfect meta, perfect karuna, mudita, upeka can only be done when you have completely understood non-self. When you have completely understood that there is no differentiation between I and me. And my wife was saying that among the four Brahma Viharas, Upeka, she said, is probably the most difficult. How to be equanimous mm. when you know, ah, oh, no, there's an idiot, he's doing an idiotic thing, but yet I have to remain equanimous. So she said, wow, to do that, I really have to be very awakened, very enlightened. Now, Metta, and I know who is asking this question. It's a wonderful brother. Meta means that I love you unconditionally. If in my loving you, you make me happy, then that's a bonus which I enjoy. If in loving you, you send me happy Father's Day card or on my birthday, you send me a gift and I say, ah, my children are so good or my friends are so good or so and so is so good to me. That's a bonus. But metta truly means that I love you 
and I want you to be happy. If you are happy, I am happy. If your happiness include my happiness, that's an additional thing. But even if it doesn't, as long as you are happy, I am happy. That's meta. And that's not easy unless you are truly a selfless person. Just as someone who is so wonderfully close to that, we say, wow, he's such a selfless man. Right? That's the expression we use. He's such a selfless man. So meta is like you holding a bird in a cage. And you say, oh, the bird is so happy, chipping away. For all I know, the bird is crying. Meta is when that bird is free, not when that bird is hidden in the cage, chipping yep. away. So for us to not be attached would mean that you have a deeper level of understanding, a deeper level of grasping the truth, not grasping onto material things. Now, people say, oh, yo, I'm a Buddhist. I cannot grasp into anything. I'm just a doormat. I lie there and let me die. Like, people walk over me. Like. No, no, no. The Buddha never said that. Please grasp onto the truth. Grasp onto wholesome things. Grasp onto metta. Grasp onto karuna. Grasp onto doing good things. Because if everybody says, I don't want to do any good thing. I don't want to do any bad thing. I also don't want to do anything. Also, we are going to see a lot really. So there are good things that the Buddha wants us to do. He never told us to let go of metta karuna, mudita upeka. He never told us to let go of our precepts. He told us to let go of our greed, our anger, our hatred, our false belief, our attachments to rites and rituals, and most dependently, and most difficult about letting go of this concept of self. That is what he taught us to let go. All right, sister? Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Punya, I have a one last question here. In your Breaking Meets, you had the chapter about transferring merits, right? I know we do dana, doing dana is one of the ways to making merits, right? And uh, uh, we also seldom uh, uh, do a closing section of the Dharma talks or any chanting uh, that we had in particular, dedication of merits for any, for, for, for that matter, right? So um, to, to me, um, I was also uh, looking into, you know, um, the terms of transferring of merits, sharing of merits, dedication of merits, and this was being used interchangeably, you know? As for, as for the Chinese, right, we, we, we do hold prayers after the death and as what the Chinese saying, um, it's part of chao tu, right? So for, for, for the date, right? But then please help us to understand these terms in the right context, especially when we talk about, you know, the Sutta also mentioned that I am the owner of the Kama, right? And uh, uh, heir to my actions, born of my actions, related through my actions, and have my actions as arbitrator. Whatever I do for good or for evil, to that will I for err. So yeah, so so yeah, this 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 terms always makes me curious and how how does this transfer of merits, sharing of merits, dedication of merits in the right context. Thank you, Sister Eileen. I think that's very important. And one of the reasons why the breaking myth thing was written was partly because of what you just raised. And um, I think that there is a lot of misconception and there are a lot of actually good work being done by people trying to explain this and locally, um, our venerable Akachita has got some really very nice and well-researched articles trying to explain this clearly. And I think that's um, important because coming from the venerable, of course, carries much more weight. But what Sister Eileen mentioned about Kama is very, very true. We are the owners of our Kama. Kama is our creator. The fact that we are going to be recycled, it's partly because of karma. And of course, there are other conditions as well, giving us a state in which we will be in. But karma is 
not only my own, but also my creator, and I'm the heir of that company. So that's a very fundamental concept which every one of us have to understand quite clearly. The understanding of karma is one of the aspects of right views, which we need to have a good foundation. Now, when one understands this, then how are we going to look at this and understand the greater picture of someone else doing a meritorious deed and then saying, oh, with this deed, now may you be well. So there are, of course, um, teachings from the canon itself, and the Buddha did teach quite clearly that there are beings who will know that Sister Eileen has done a good job. These beings can be your relatives. These beings can be people that you know directly, or they may be your distant relatives for which you have no idea who they are, or they may be even your great, great ancestors from whom you have no idea who they are. So when Sister Eileen does something good, Sister Eileen says, and I want to do this good job. I want to do this great, wholesome deed. And I want to invite the unseen beings, the devas, to come. And that is why traditionally in a traditional center, before we start a Dhamma talk or whatever, we break tong, tong, tong. It's like a public announcement, like in school assembly, you know, a public announcement. And of course, if you go to Burma, they have this big bell, they go gong, 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 the whole village will know. And when someone does a dana, they also do the same thing to, allow, to announce it. So when Sister Eileen says, I'm doing this good deed, I'm offering this, or I'm doing this charity, and here, all my unseen relatives, all the guardian devas of this compound, come, be aware, rejoice in this, and let us all partake. And the word is animodana in this wholesome deed. Now, there are a few conditions here. And the Buddha himself said so. If you look up the book, the references in the book, the Breaking Myth book, first, they are aware. That means if they are unaware, it's not going to be helpful. Remember Janasoni asking the Buddha whether offerings, if the person is unaware that you are making an offering, it's not going to be helpful. Which means, if, let's say, a departed relative gone into the womb of another lady, then whatever your dedication or merits or offerings are not going to be helpful. Because that person in the womb of another woman is not going to know. All right, that means he's now in the pregnant uterus of another lady and you are making offerings or sharing merits to that person, then that person is not going to know and it's not going to be helpful. So the person must know that you are doing it. So for example, if a relative is now a Pieta, a ghost, and now this person knows because that person is still around and he knows that Eileen is doing this good deed on my behalf or in my name or sharing merits to me, and I rejoice in it. So the Buddha said that the person must know and must rejoice. And in doing so, when the person knows and they rejoice, the person is actually creating his own merits. Then, he or she then, is actually creating his own merits because he or she is rejoicing in this act that you had done. So it is not Sister Eileen taking a pizza and then dividing it into this karma belongs to me, and this one belongs to you. No, it's not that. People seem to have this mistaken notion that you can share or you can transfer like a piece of pizza. No, you can't because Sister Eileen's karma is Sister Eileen. If I can transfer my karma, then surely when I die, I want to give away all my bad karma. But unfortunately... Yeah, true. Yeah. All right. So first and foremost, let's say somebody passed away recently. Yeah. And that person is now in the wake or yep. whatever, mm. then I want to share mm. in common parlance merits with this person. Mm. But it is actually not sharing. If that person knows, and the person knows that I'm doing this good deed, then this person rejoices. And the person actually creates in the act of rejoicing his or her own merits. So your merits are not by any means lesser. That doesn't happen. You still have your exact same merits. But this person knows 
that, ah, my grandniece Eileen is doing it in my name. My grandniece is dedicating this marriage to me. And I'm very happy I've got such a good grandniece in Eileen. I rejoice Anumodana in this act. And by doing this, I actually create my own merits because if you look at the generation of merits, one of it is rejoicing in good deeds, rejoicing in the good acts. So I think that we have to be clear that when we say share, although in common parlance, we say, oh, sharing of merits, it is not technically sharing a pizza. Mm. When we say transferring of merits, that's even more misleading because yeah. actually you don't transfer anything. Yeah, it's correct. not a bank yeah. account whereby transfer thing as i said if that is possible i'm going to transfer all my bad karma to the rest all right but what yeah. we are actually doing is the word dedication of merits mm. and actually the word dedication of merits is found in one of the articles that the cheetah wrote and i thought that that was very very good the word he chose dedication was very very good but then uh, quite a number of our chanting books uh, put there as a uh, transferring yes, of yes. Uh, marriage, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So mm. in that sense, it's a bit misleading. And yeah. as I said, to change it is not easy because yeah. it's in our common okay. thinking. Yeah. So it's not easy to change it. And I will upset a lot of people if I have to go around telling mm. you know, them. Because I remember also one of the venerable mentioned about, you know, after the death, you know, no point of having to chow to. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So it was like, mm, this one will again break, break the customs law. You know, that's why when you dedicate marriage, you don't dedicate to, uh, we, uh, sorry, we usually dedicate to all our departed relatives, uh -huh. to all the unseen beings. Mm. And of course, in a wake or in a funeral service, then we do mention a specific person's name. Mm. Now, in that same context, I'm also asked that, oh, uh, Ching Ming, for example, we make offerings. I have a family altar in my house right here and we make offerings and then of course people ask why are you making offerings why are you praying and i often said i often have to explain that I'm, I'm, i am not praying i am not making prayers in the english meaning of that word i'm actually paying respects to my ancestors and there's a difference and just because somebody in the old days translated it oh ching ming you're going to pray to your ancestors Actually, I'm not praying to my ancestors. I'm paying respect to my ancestors. I'm doing my best to show them honor in a traditional way, which they may be familiar with. And of course, in our Chinese culture, that would mean beyond putting flowers, putting in some of their favorite food, their favorite drinks, which is very much part of our context of traditional way of showing respect. So very often we would put a cup of tea, or in my father's case, because he loved coffee, we put a cup of coffee or some, some of their favorite food as a pure gesture that we remember them and we respect them. So I, I think that this is important, that um, it's nothing wrong in that culture. People may misunderstand because they think we are praying, but I understand I'm not praying. I'm paying respect to my ancestor. I'm showing them the due credit for all the good things that they have done. I stand on their shoulders. And I think that that is something very important. Now, I think that the Chinese culture of Ching Ming once a year where we pay respect is something that should be preserved because gratitude is the very first teaching the Buddha gave after the Buddha became awakened. Many people think that it's the middle way or the eightfold path, but actually gratitude is the very first teaching the Buddha gave upon his awakening. And it is non-verbal. It is by his action. He showed gratitude to the Bodhi tree for sheltering him. So the Bodhi tree is a tree, not even a human. And here, I think that in us showing our gratitude to our ancestors by going to pay respect is something valuable and something that should be preserved. It is not in the canon, if you are to say, give me a sentence which says you must go, no, it's not in the canon. But as I mentioned earlier, there's so many things which are also not in the canon, but which are good things, which we still do. All right? Yes, sister. Thank you, Dr. Bunya. 
thanks a lot for this uh, Q&A session. It's been a very interesting uh, topic that uh, we have discussed. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful and a pleasure time to have uh, this uh, evening uh, uh, together and learn a lot uh, from this uh, session as well. Uh, thank you so much uh, again for uh, spending the time and also the technical team on board. Uh, so thank you so much. That's all. And see you uh, soon in the uh, uh, walking in the Buddha's uh, footprint uh, session. Yeah, thank you.